When I was a little girl, I remember sitting, like sitting on my dad's lap when I was just a teeny tiny little child and just mashing on a keyboard. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 15, Shannon Morse. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons like Don Davis. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell and support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. What's going on, everybody? I am your host, Jason Howell, here with another episode, another week of the Techsploder podcast, the show where I get to sit down with my friends in technology, learn a little bit more about them, and um, you know, continually I'm surprised by how similar our stories are as far as you know, being kids, loving technology, what that leads us to do. That's why I enjoy doing this show. I'm also a nostalgia nerd. Like I love nostalgia conversations, so... That's a healthy dose of nostalgia, I'm sure, coming up on today's show. Um, today's guest, I have a little blurb to read for you, Shannon, so don't. Uh, <laughs> so I hope that's okay. Shannon Morris is cybersecurity expert, content creator on YouTube. Shannon has been an influential voice in consumer technology and internet security since 2008. That was when she joined Hack5, a cybersecurity collective that was that's really built around uh, education and exploration of cybersecurity and security topics at large. Shannon is currently the owner of Morse Code Creative, where she hosts Mor uh, Morse Code on her YouTube channel. She also contributes regularly to the Daily Tech News Show podcast and... Shannon, you have another YouTube channel devoted to Sailor Moon fandom called Sailor Snubs. How you doing, Shannon? Do. I'm good. How are you, Jason? Awesome. I'm amazing. Even better now that I've got you on the other side of the screen here. Yay. I know. It's been a while. <laughs> Sailor Moon. I mean, I realize that's not technology specifically, but um, but that's that's cool. Although at the same time, like I don't really know a whole lot about Sailor Moon, but I'm sure there's plenty of people who absolutely love the collectibles and everything. Has that been kind yeah. of a fun kind of detour or do you consider it a detour? Like what's that Definitely. all about? Uh, I've always had a passion for Sailor Moon ever since I was like a little kid. So uh -huh. this is, it, it's been, it's kind of been an outlet for me and something that I've always treated as a hobby. So anytime yeah. I'm like really tired or burnt out from talking about tech, I'm like, I'm just going to do a video about Sailor Moon. Cause then I feel like I'm still being productive, but I'm doing something that's very like fun and lighthearted and has nothing to do with the heavyweight of cybersecurity or technology. And oh, man. No I have kidding. one of the biggest collections collections in the United States of like Sailor Moon collectors. I have a whole bedroom that's just like filled to the brim of Sailor Moon collection items. <laughs> no kidding. And are yeah. there like, I'm <laughs> sure there are probably like conferences and conventions around Sailor Moon and stuff like that. Have you done yeah. that stuff and kind of shown off some of your best collectibles? Anything along oh, those yeah. lines? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've actually traveled to Japan for some Sailor Moon like museums and exhibitions. And no, I've also. Well, I know you've been to I Japan also, many times, yeah, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was also uh, invited. I've been to, invited to one like anime convention to talk about collecting and how to do it like on a budget. So that was really fun to do. And it, it allowed me to bring out like one of my expertises about like buying stuff from Japan and how to use technology to be able to import things uh, on a cheaper dime and talk about, you know, collecting and being a smart collector and a savvy collector. So it was really cool. <laughs> oh, that's so neat. So then Sailor Moon is your palate cleanser for, technology yeah. and cybersecurity topics. Because I sometimes, I find myself in a very similar space, uh, state, which is I love technology. And, you know, as as you do as well, like we live and breathe it on, as mm -hmm. our career. And yeah, sometimes even if technology itself isn't heavy, it's just, it's a lot of one thing. And sometimes you need to step out of that realm just to kind exactly. of take a breather, take a breath and do something different. That sounds like a really um, effective strategy to have Another thing, very different, but kind of almost also dialed into your, you know, some of the strengths that you pull on for your yeah. tech and security YouTube coverage and podcast. Absolutely. Like I, I use my Sailor Moon channel as kind of a experiment 
experiment in Mm -hmm. analytics and things that I'm learning about how YouTube works and what works and what doesn't. So sometimes I will test those features over on my Sailor Snubs channel, and then I'll bring them over to my technology channel if they do work. So if I find Mm -hmm. that like specific ways of building out my thumbnail work really well, well on the Sailor Snubs channel, I'll be like, okay, I should use that font on my tech channel and see if that works as well. So I, I'm always like testing things and mm-hmm. I, I will usually use the smaller audience as like a guinea pig and then bring it over. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Or the, or, or maybe not just like the, like thumbnail creation or whatever, but I imagine, you know, cause like looking at sailor snubs, there's a lot of, a lot of like uh, collectibles roundups, which have their, you know, kind of technology analog to, you know, and so maybe there's something about the approach or the style of that, that can be uh, uniquely brought over to the technology space as well. So along those lines. I just yeah. did like a review of Sailor Moon keyboards and it was cool. Oh, there you go. I was like, Venn diagram. Yeah, they overlap. Yeah. <laughs> I was able to be like, this is how you, you know, uh, take out your mechanical switch and put in a different switch if you want to change it up. And this is what they sound like. And I was able to talk about like all that nerdy stuff that um, you only talk about with keyboard reviews. But I was also able to make it super like weeb for Sailor Moon fans. <laughs> it was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, yeah, well, I, I like I said, I'm very clueless on the Sailor Moon thing, but I love that you've <laughs> kind of gone uh, fully into it. Is do you see like I guess when I think of anime as like a an a entertainment kind of space, or maybe space is the wrong word, but anime isn't something that I uh, was introduced to as a kid. If it had been, perhaps I would have been a little bit further into it. But when I think about yeah. anime, a lot of times I think about science fiction to a certain degree. I don't know. There's, I guess what I'm saying is there's something in my mind that kind of does take anime and technology and put them in very similar vectors, even if it is oh, just yeah. animation that might have nothing to do with technology. But there's something to that, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, I think we're close in age um i'm 38 i don't i don't know yeah. how old you are i'm what a are decade you, older than you oh <laughs> okay so so this is relevant <laughs> yeah um anime really blew up when i was like five to 15 years old in the 90s and i know that before i was at that age where i started watching it uh the the big animes were like robotech and big mobile suit gundam type mm, animes. yes and that, and that, that I was think that's probably of part that of good. where my mind goes right because those yeah. are the ones that I really recognized back uh, back when I was a little bit. I wasn't quite in yeah. elementary school or, or high school, but it was more like you know my my early twenties. My friends were getting right. into some of those animes, like Ghost in the Machine and stuff. Right. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It wasn't until I was at those ages that like magical girl anime, slice of life type anime, like that kind of stuff, started getting popular in the United States. And that's when I was a child and when it was really influential for me. Mm, hmm. Yeah. Cool stuff. So let's, um, I love, I love having these conversations, but probably uh, one of my favorite parts of it is, is kind of going back into childhood. Like there's something, I was thinking about this the other day, there's something about nostalgia that is really enjoyable for me. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Like when, when I think about being a kid and, you know, for me, the Commodore 64 was like a really like oh, a, yeah. a cornerstone piece of technology for me. That was a very definitive piece of technology for me. And when I think about very specific memories around the Commodore 64, like I, I kind of get like I just got goosebumps. Like it takes me back in time to this like joyous place around technology. And sometimes as we were just talking about technology can feel kind of heavy, you know, oh, and, yeah. but but I love the joy <laughs> of it and, and what kind of brought us into there. I'm curious, like, I know a little bit about this because there is some of this, uh, you know, that you've shared on the internet, but tell me if you had to pick like an earliest kind of cornerstone memory or something that comes to mind around technology, like what comes to mind when I ask that question? Is there like an early kind of moment where you're like, oh man, you know, I loved technology in that particular moment. Absolutely. Um, when I was a little girl, I remember sitting like sitting on my dad's lap when I was just a teeny tiny little child and just mashing on a keyboard because he he used to build computers when I was a little kid. And oh, he always would bring me in his computer room and be like, oh, look at this thing. And back in the day, we had those like 
black screens with the green image, uh-huh. like the green the ASCII art. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was mm-hmm. like so love old. that. And the so machines old. actually made noise. They're like, yeah. You know? Oh yeah. And I remember like, <laughs> I remember the feel of the keyboard cause it was so mechanical and so yeah. like the entire keyboard was just white in color. Like there was no artistry that went into it back in the day. Uh-huh. It was just, uh-huh. it was mainly just made for logic. Like this is how you use a keyboard. I remember like, the floppy disks that we used to have and the little drives that we used to have in computers and that big thing with all the red switches and you had to turn it on in order for your computer to actually like boot up and it would take forever for the thing to boot up. Oh man, the the, the, the flicky switch to turn on the computer. That's something (laughs) I hadn't thought of. That's true. That's so cool. Now they're like these 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 like flush <laughs> buttons that you just lightly tap and the computer comes right? on. Yeah, I need a big switch, <laughs> big red switch. That now we have clicks. like fancy biometrics built into our yes. power buttons and it's like, it's not fun anymore. We used to have those like big, really like resounding oh, clicks. Yeah. <laughs> it gave you the war games kind of vibes. Like, yeah, yeah. I could, yeah. I, I could hack and do something with this machine right. <laughs> because of a big red switch that just kind of has a little sense of danger <laughs> to it. Like, don't touch the switch. Yeah, that's cool. I remember, oh, when did it come out? I need to look it up real quick. Um, there was a game. I would walk by my dad's computer room and he used to play this game when I was really young and I would see him. Um, it was a flight sim. So he had one of those like pi- piloting, uh, whatever they were uh-huh. called. <laughs> and Joy- like it, it joystick was, or yeah, joystick. He had a joystick yeah. for his computer. It was called a uh, fury three. And it came out okay. in 1995 and he was obsessed. So he let me play it when I was like 10 years old, like nine or 10 years old. And so I would walk in the room and be able to like play with his joystick and be able to play Fury 3. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. Like I still remember the music from that game, even though I'm 38 now. Like it was so long ago. <laughs> I love that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Microsoft so Home. Many, like, Yes. Oh, man. Some people carry the world on their shoulders. You carry it <laughs> in your sights. <laughs> I was That's really good awesome. at that game too. Cause you could like go in tunnels and be able to like shoot up the enemies with your little plane. And man, I was good at that game. Like I was doing like barrel rolls and stuff. It was so much fun. Like I, I remember like, flying up to this super pixelated city with all these enemies. And I was like, yeah, I'm in a boss battle. Oh man. I had so much fun. (laughs) Oh, see, I'm trying, I'm trying desperately to pull up, see if I can pull up some B roll of this. Cause I want to see it. If you You find some like that'll bring you back. Well, this is, uh, this is Windows. (gasps) Yes. Yeah. 1995. It's so pixelated. It looks horrible, but there you go. That's Oh, but man, at the time that looked amazing. Yeah. I mean, the fact that everything was so three dimensional, (laughs) although kind of not flipping backwards. I was so good at that. I would have been way into this game back then. It was so fun. Almost has like a Star Fox quality to it. It does. This is like Star Fox before Star Fox. Yeah. (laughs) So this was the first time I had played a flight sim. I was really into that. I was really into mist, but it took me years to finally figure out all the puzzles for mist. And back in the day we would sit there and like write all the puzzles in a notebook, me and my two friends Mm -hmm. and any, we all had the game. So like my friend Joe would go home to his house and write puzzles down after school. And if he figures something out, he would run over to my house and just open the front door. Cause that's what we did as kids. He wouldn't even knock (laughs) and he'd be like, Shannon, I figured out that puzzle with the animals. I'd be like, Oh my God. So we immediately would have to put him into our game and be able to save. Like it was so cool. (laughs) Oh, I mean, mist was such a a cornerstone uh, game for the time. It really was. Yeah. Mist was, it really set the stage for so much that came after it. Yeah. Um, Yet at the same, and I can say that from a historical perspective, I can't say that from a personal perspective. I really didn't play it a whole lot, but I've Mm. seen so much about it and I have played it. So much lore. I didn't get like super deep into it. Let's just say that, but I recognize it for what it was, which it was really ahead of its time. It really set the stage. I didn't really like recognize what I was doing at the time, but I mm. like really hyper focused on these games. And with Mist, eventually I discovered that there was a book that was written. Um, I still have it to this day. It's like the Mist trilogy. There's an entire book about the lore of Mist, and I read that mm. when I was a kid. It's a big book. It's like Lord of the Rings thick, very thick. Yeah, book. I'm not surprised. Um, 
there's multiple games that were built around the Mist storyline and the plot uh, that came out after Mist, and I ended up playing all of those games too, including the Mist um, remake when they remade it for uh, mobile as well as up- updated operating systems. Mm-hmm. But I I still have my original discs <laughs> to this day. Uh, they're not playable, but <laughs> yeah, frame them, put them, them. all on the wall. They're, they're a good yeah, keepsake. They're, they're just so beautiful. Like I love the art on the front of the mist, like play disc for windows mm. 95. Like they're so pretty. <laughs> they mm-hmm. just take me back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet. So your dad, so it sounds like your dad was a very, um, a, a very important figure in your early uh, love and discovery of technology. That's really cool. I know yeah. that you built a computer um, when you were nine years old. Is that right? Yeah. Did your dad help you with that? Or like, what? What? Yep. what's the story behind that? How'd that go? Um, that was, yeah, it was around that time. My dad used to take me into one of those really old computer stores back when computer stores were a thing in the Midwest. We lived in, it was either Texas or Indiana. I don't know. I'm Mm. a military brat. It was somewhere around there. But he would take me in this store. And I remember the smell whenever he brought Mm. me in that store and looking at like an entire wall of motherboards. And I was so thrilled to look at everything and be like, what is that? How does this work? And he always knew the answers whenever I asked him questions about different technological pieces. So eventually he was like, let's build a computer together. So Mm -hmm. it was around when I was like nine-ish that we built my first computer. Well, it was a family computer. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We built the first computer on um, our dining table. And he let me like put in the pieces myself and figure out how everything was set so that you could figure out how the components work together. And that was the first time that it really delved into how hardware works and how you choose your components. Uh, Mm. After that, I ended up like that was the family computer. So it wasn't mine, but I, I felt like some ownership over that because like it was my baby. I built it. Like I built it with my dad and I was so proud. So (laughs) <laughs> eventually I mean, it's, it's like real life like, lego at that point right but yeah. it's real life lego that suddenly everybody can use a lie upon and that's yeah so cool that you you made it yeah absolutely so i got really into like uh building websites when i was a teenager um on like GeoCities back in the day mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. i got As really into yeah. learning <laughs> yeah like java <laughs> html all that good stuff so you i was spending so much time on my family computer that my dad was like, we need to build you a computer. (laughs) So then I built like my own personal computer that I was able to set up in my own room. And that's when I started delving into like the internet and how like what, look at all these amazing things that you can discover on the internet, Mm -hmm. like sailor moon galleries. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. what I was into. (laughs) Nothing nefarious. I was looking at sailor moon. (laughs) Of course. And, and, and like fanfics. Sa- yeah. So Sailor Moon, like, were you going to uh, fan pages that were created or were oh, these yeah. news groups or like, you know, like you oh, said? Or, yeah, I was yeah. I was like I was in the Midwest. So like we didn't have a lot of Sailor Moon fans there and we didn't have a lot of places where we could go where we could find people that were also into Sailor Moon. So I was I was using the internet internet as a way to find people that were kind of like me. And mm-hmm. I did, I ended up finding like a ton of people who were really into sailor moon. Um, they had their own galleries and then I started developing my own sailor moon gallery. So I was like, I was a part of this little internet community at the time. I don't yeah, remember what yeah. my username was, but <laughs> yeah, it was so much fun. <laughs> and this was, and this was geo cities you were saying, right? Or, it was, was it, yes. It was GeoCities. Were you part of any like web rings? You know how they had those web ring things oh, yeah. that you could click through? This, yeah, this strikes like me a... as the sort of thing that would be part of like a Sailor Moon web ring. <laughs> it was. Sort. Yes, I, I was a part of a Sailor Moon gallery web ring. And there was also, uh, at the time, there was like a bunch of licensing issues with the anime. So mm. I joined a group called Save Our Sailors, which was supposed to save Sailor Moon in North America so that we can continue seeing the dub on uh, American television. Because um, like there, so many people like didn't think that a, a cartoon about a bunch of like superhero girls would make it in America. And a lot of mm. companies did not give it a chance. So Save Our Sailors ended up being with like this fan made um, 
the thing to give it some traction in North America. And it kind of worked. So it was kind of mm. cool to be a part of that, like be a part of that community at the time and be able to make some change. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, that really was, you know, to, to what you were saying a couple of, of minutes ago. And I think it's something that we definitely all take for granted at this point, but when the internet first kind of became more widely adopted, people started getting their personal computers and, you know, being able to get their dial up modem, you know, to, to call into the internet, this, this idea of, I live in this place where there is no one else around me from a physical perspective that shares my interest, but now I can go online and I can find that community. Like that was huge. Yeah. And I mean, it was. like I said, we take that for granted now. The, and, and, in, and in so many ways, I mean, it's probably obvious to say this, but in so many ways, our world has been shaped from a global perspective. We're all follow, like there's still those sub communities, but we're all following similar trends and similar approaches in so many different areas because the internet brings, you know, the wider community together. But back then, like that was that was a real kind of progressive and out there idea that yeah. like I'm a fan of Sailor Moon. There's no one around me that is, but I can find the random hundred people or however many people across the globe who are, <laughs> and we can make our own community. You know? Yes, exactly. That's so, that's so cool. That was so empowering at the time. It was. It really was, especially like as a little nerdy girl with buck teeth and curly hair and big glasses. Like I didn't have a lot of friends when I was in elementary school and middle school. Yeah, um, yeah. I kind of came into my own confidence through like being in theater in high school. And that really helped, mm -hmm. m helped me make friends. But when I was a little kid, when I was a tween and a, a little kid, like in middle school, uh, I was bullied for being into computers and video games and Sailor Moon at school. Like people mm -hmm. thought it was funny. Like I would bring, um, we used to have because those like different. player guides. Yeah. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. different. We used to have player guides and we used to have uh, like a Sailor Moon role playing game. And I had those books as a kid and I would bring them to school and look at them during lunchtime. Or I would draw pictures of my favorite characters during lunchtime. And I got bullied a ton when I was a little kid. Like mm. I remember a girl laughing at me and like yelling like, Oh, why are you drawing this took like a, a male character from sailor moon? She was like, do you have a crush on him? Which he was uh, hot. Yeah. I mean, for cartoon characters, he was super cute. So <laughs> <Right>. just saying, <laughs> just saying <laughs> I ain't embarrassed, but at the time, like she was yelling these things. And I remember yeah. the class just kind of laughing and giggling about it. And I was just mm -hmm. like, like, I don't have friends that are into this kind of stuff. So, yeah, right. I definitely use the Internet to develop some friendships and develop some community. And I don't know if the people I was talking to were other girls my age or if they were like 40 year old men who uh, who knows, but they were nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I didn't I wasn't posting anything I should have. So or I shouldn't have. So it was OK. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, you were finding the community that you wished yeah. that you had in, in person, uh, in yeah. real life. And, in our little yeah. Angel Fire and GeoCities gallery community. <laughs> yes. Oh, what a time. The, the GeoCities gallery. Sometimes it's fun to go on to the Internet Archive and do the Wayback Machine and, and check out some of those things. And revisit. Oh, God. I wonder and, if and, my pages are It's also are kind of painful. <laughs> I bet they are. I, mean, I would imagine so. Yeah. I know at it. one point or another, like, I think it was around the time I started working with Hack5, I logged mm. into my old, old accounts and I deleted them all. Like, like I used to have a, a live journal, um, mm. <laughs> which was really big for teenagers at that time. Mm -hmm. Like, we would, go, mm -hmm. we would log in after school and be like, this is what happened after school. And it was like a public journal about what you do. Um, yep. And a lot of people were really into it. So that's kind of like how I interacted with other people who were nerds at my school, but also like some of the online community of Moonies that we found. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Moonies. That's that's a new word for me. Moonies. Uh, moonies. <laughs> there's like two yeah. terms for that. There's like a weird cult that goes by Moonies, but there's also the Sailor Moon community. So I own it. It's Sailor Moon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take it over. You deserve to have it. You deserve to have it. Um, you you mentioned your theater um, experience and your theater background. Did your technology worlds uh, ever kind of collide with your theater worlds, or like what what kind of involvement did you have in theater? 
Um, I was an a actress and I was a thespian. I guess I still am. You're a lifetime thespian once you become yeah. a thespian. So the, yeah, um, right. once I gained enough points being in theater, I ended up being a thespian. Um, yeah, I was really into being on stage and acting out different characters. And that really helped me like gain some confidence in terms of say. just understanding like how to interact with an audience and how to use your voice and how to uh, just how to enunciate and be a better uh, public performer. And mm -hmm. I was so shy and so nerdy growing up and I had a stutter, which I still do. Um, I definitely still stutter and I still st say things like, um, and, uh, like I still uh, do that to this day. <laughs> I know. Right. Don't we all? It's hard. But it's hard being not in, to. Being in high school, um, one of the ways that technology ended up kind of intermingling with theater was re realizing that there's so much that goes into a production. Like I learned mm. lighting. I learned how to use a switchboard. Um, I learned about microphones uh, and lavaliers when I was doing theater. Um, and I also learned some journalism skills, too, because I joined a journalism class to help promote the theater work that I was doing for the high school. Because, mm. like, we sold tickets. We always tried to get a sellout show. Um, and that that money helped contribute to our future performances because, like, our, our drama school, our drama class teacher, Mr. Beatty, uh, for Waynesville High School. He was so cool. He was the one that like really helped me gain some confidence, but he always put that money towards like licensing the shows because we had to order mm -hmm. licensing to legally do the show, which a lot of high schools don't do. And then we also had to pay for like fixing lights if a light ended up going out or something like that, or like new costumes. Most of them were purchased from Goodwill and did not fit, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. They totally worked. <laughs> So I learned yeah. a lot about like just how a production, how hard it is to build a production because there's so mm -hmm. much involved. And like even when something goes wrong, you have to figure it out. And that's something that I have brought very much into what I do to this day, especially like if I'm interviewing somebody at a convention, like if a mic goes out, do you have a backup? Like you got to figure all this stuff out on the fly. And yes. much of that I figured out when I was doing theater. Yeah, it's interesting what you learn about yourself when you're when you're faced with a situation like that. You can think about oh, situations yeah. like that in advance <laughs> and you can think, "Oh, I'll do this, I'll do that," or "Oh, I won't know what to do." You know, that yeah. sometimes that's been me is like, "Oh, I hope that never happens because I'll probably freeze, you know, in the moment." Right. But then the moment <laughs> happens, and what do you know? You're resilient. You figure it out, you know? You yeah, get to you the figure other it out. Side, hopefully. Uh, you learn a lot about yourself in situations like that. That is super cool. Um I remember yeah. having a, uh, there was one time when we had a lot of bad luck that happened during a live performance of Into the Woods. I was playing Cinderella. So I was one of the main cast, um, one of the like lead roles for the show. Um, the first thing that happened was the dress that is supposed to come from my fairy godmother's tree. Uh, it did not fall how it was supposed to. It was still like it was on a rope and it was supposed to be let down from the, the catwalk above the theater or above mm -hmm. the stage. It like fell, but it got stuck. So I had to like untie it on set and then run off set, set so I could change. But I ended up leaving like a noose hanging on oh, set. No. It was Oh, really no. bad. And I was yeah. like, oh, no. And <laughs> that same night, we had a big wooden cow that was supposed to be the like one guy's he had a pet cow that he always like drug around on stage. It was one of the characters. And he mm -hmm. had to take it from one sa side of the stage to the other side of the stage behind behind the actual um, set. I was running from the opposite side. So we ended up colliding and I had this huge like bump on my head because I went boom and then landed on the floor behind set. I don't know if anybody heard me, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, so that oh, didn't happen God. in front of people. I was going to say if no, it happened it behind people, stage. <laughs> yeah, at least at least behind the stage, it probably made a little oh, it was so scary. People had no idea. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet that's a, and that's also a high pressure environment, right? Like you really Very learn a lot pressure. about resilience yeah. and all that kind of stuff. A lot of what you're talking about probably incredibly, um, you know, valid or uh, applicable to what you do now as a, you know, as a YouTube personality and oh, yeah. all the production yeah. that you're doing now, that's the foundation for it really. Yeah. A lot of the yeah. like high pressure, you have to be ready to go. Like you have mm -hmm. to get ready. Like if you, 
you know, now, nowadays, like I work with a lot of sponsors and I have to make sure that my videos are ready by a specific date. And if Mm -hmm. they aren't, I could lose that income. I could lose that sponsor. Mm -hmm. So I always have to make sure that I'm in charge of my own schedule, all my technology work. So I'm constantly like making sure that things are working and things are in order or I have a backup system in case I need it. Like Mm -hmm. there's a lot of production quality that goes into like making a high quality professional YouTube uh, channel. And a lot of that is entirely missed when you see the final production. Like people are just like, Oh, it took you 15 minutes to make this video. And I'm like, Nope, yeah. it takes like 16 hours. Oh, like it takes a long if you time. Only knew. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you only knew, <laughs> if you only knew what it took to get this 15 minutes worth of stuff that you're, you're viewing. <laughs> yeah. And you can keep going down that road and keep complicating it more and more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kids have it you easy and, these days. <laughs> you and I had a conversation not too long ago. Um, um, where, you know, I've reached out to a lot of people I know who do the independent thing because, you know, I'm trying to do that myself. And one of the things that you told me that I've been practicing a lot is to not overcomplicate, to, yeah. to you know, um, I my my desire or my... Um, yeah, I guess I guess my focus because of 20 years of working for large scale operations like Twit and mm-hmm. CNET is to you know produce highest quality, you know everything is you know as top top level as it needs to be and I had that conversation with you and, and you were like, you know, well sometimes you don't need to go there. You can you can dial it back and it can be good enough that way. And yeah. so it's been a real it's been a real process for me kind of undoing that a little bit. And I've, you know, experienced the same kind of things that you were talking about. Sometimes you don't need to go top tier, highest quality. Sometimes that's, it's unnecessary. Like it might make you feel better or it might look nicer, but at the end of the day, does it make a difference about the message that you're delivering or whatever? Right. Yeah. That was a really valuable piece of uh, advice that I practice daily. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was I mean, myself, I had to really focus on that because it took me forever to understand that if, if I'm trying to make everything perfect, I'm never going to finish a project. You'll never finish. Yeah. There's never an end if you're trying to make it perfect because there's no such thing as perfect, right? Like there's always something else you can do. And like you, I've worked with a lot of professional teams and in like networking studios. I worked at Twit. I was a producer there and I was mm-hmm. also working with like Sony and and I worked with Nvidia in their studio and I'm flying mm-hmm. out today to work with another company at their studio. So I've had all these experiences. Even Revision 3, I worked there for Techzilla. So mm-hmm. I've I've had all these experiences of working with these really high production companies that have like cameramen editors, they have a producer. So scaling it back and being like, no, this is a one woman show. I have to really scale it back and pay attention to like, how can I make technology work for me now as compared to what I learned 10 years ago? Like it's, it's a lot easier nowadays if you take advantage of what, what people have for productions now, like switchboards are not as complicated as they used to be. Like a Mm -hmm. TriCaster is really complicated and I'm happy I learned it, but also I know I can do the same thing with a stream deck. So like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy the stream Stream deck deck and OBS and like OBS is free and stream deck is like a hundred some odd dollars. Yeah, totally. It's, it's crazy what technology (laughs) has democratized in the production space, you know, and and we've seen over the last 20 years. And it's been really interesting to me kind of along this, the lines of what we're talking here. Um, and then I got to take a quick break, um, is that, you know, as we record this, my old job and you, you used to work there too, uh, this week in tech twit, they're closing down their studio. And so as they were closing down the studio, that's collected gear from like the last 20 years. Like I've been there four or five times now. Cause I do live in the same city as, as the studio. I live in Petaluma, but I've been in there because I can't pull myself away because it's, it's almost like it's almost like a museum at this yeah. point. Everything's, you know, they're pulling it all apart and they're organizing all this old hardware. And it's just crazy to see with my eyes the technology that was required to do th- over the past 15 to 20 years, let's say, that um, now we can do by firing up a, an instance of StreamYard and throwing a, you know, an HD or a 4K oh, camera so into a computer. <laughs> and 
you can do every and I, I guess to the you know to the point of exactly what we're talking about all that equipment can be used to do those things but it's not necessary it's not necessary, it's not necessary to spend yes. all that money to have that high quality uh it right. might make you feel better but you don't need it anymore it's just that right. the times have changed one of the biggest notes that one of my friends said um before you take your break is you can create a YouTube channel from your phone. You can start oh, there. Yeah. You don't have to buy a computer. You don't have to For buy sure. anything. You can edit it on your phone. You can record it on your phone. We have 4K abilities on our phones now. We have yeah, excellent and it looks battery. Great. Yeah. And it looks wonderful. And you can yeah. even upload from your phone and make your thumbnail from your phone. Like you don't have to have all the technology in the world to start a channel. And that's something that I've been trying to trying to realize as a traditional <laughs> Produ producer <laughs> totally it's hard to undo that it like it and yes because you know in the last six months i've bought a lot of of gear to you know start up my independent uh, content creation business and i can <laughs> now look stuff, back <laughs> i can now look back and look at these things and be like okay those made sense I don't yeah. know what the heck I was thinking when I got that thing. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like now at this point, I realize what I had heard prior, which is you don't really need all those things. But man, is it right. uh, is it difficult to undo 20 years of experience in that one well, yeah. mindset <laughs> to go into a new mindset? It's, it's yes, a it total is. mind twister. Um, going to take a very, very quick break. And then I think we've got about 10, maybe 15 more minutes with you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how you got into security, because that's a huge part of what you do uh, yeah. that is coming up. All right. So we've talked a little bit about kind of your kind of childhood uh, technology um, experiences and how that that fire was lit up for you from a, you know, from a passion perspective in technology. Did security come into play then or how did that kind of emerge into your awareness and, you know, eventually join the Hack5 team and, and all that? Like, what's what's the foundation for your security background? Because that's something that you are very, very known for. That's a huge part of, yeah. of what, you know, what some of these companies that are hiring you, you know, to work with them, what they're hiring you for. Yeah, cybersecurity has become like a huge proponent of what I do now. And mm -hmm. it wasn't my first passion. I didn't really understand like why online security and privacy is so important until I was downloading music on Napster. <laughs> like mm -hmm. was, As we and all I were. got in trouble with my dad. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was, was one like, of my questions. Did tech get you into trouble? Here we go. <laughs> tech definitely got me into trouble. Like I was mm -hmm. a pretty good, I was a good kid. I was the, I'm the oldest and I always wanted to make a good impression on my little brother and sister. And mm -hmm. I didn't get into a lot of trouble. Like I was a really good kid. I always, I never had a curfew, never needed one because my parents could trust me. So I, I did not get into trouble. Like I didn't even drink until I was legally able to, like I, yeah, I wasn't interested. Too. Yeah. I was such a nerd. Like I was just sitting at home reading books and building Sailor Moon websites coding like I was <laughs> and playing miss like I was a yeah. I was a dork <laughs> Love but it, yeah I part of that nerdiness was I was like I want to download music because I love music and I was downloading like Sailor Moon Japanese theme songs like <laughs> like <laughs> but my dad the world's found music out. available to your fingertips <laughs> for free and of course I I can so identify with that though because um <laughs> Because like I said, like when I was a kid, you know, cornerstone piece of technology for me, my Commodore 64, I remember very early on, uh, you know, I had to mow lawns and I wanted to listen to music while I mowed the lawns. I didn't choose necessarily like actual music that you'd buy. I would record demo music from the Commodore 64, like demo Whoa. scene music on the no cassette. Way. Me and okay, my friend, actually, we, we traded these. That things. is nerdy. <laughs> It's super nerdy, but I loved it. We like it was the friends. music that I listened to at the time. Totally. We totally would have been friends when we were yeah. kids. I'd be like, oh, no, wait, can I have a copy? Like, that's Yeah, so cool. it's rad. I still have the tape. You know, it's all colorful. It's one of those old Memorex like cassette tapes oh, yeah. with like the, the yellow and like pink kind of, you know, it looks super 80s. And yeah, oh gosh, it's all my like Commodore that. 64 songs. Oh my God. I can't so, believe so by we're downloading about that. this music. <clears throat> yeah. I um I I must have downloaded a virus because my dad was very angry. <laughs> he was just oh, like, I can't boy. believe you did that. Like, 
I don't remember if I got grounded. I I have I have no idea. I don't remember what he did, but I'm pretty yeah. sure I got grounded or like he took away my internet access or something. But that's even worse. Yeah, that was the first time that I was like, oh, there's things that can happen on the internet. That's bad. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I experienced that. And then when I was in uh, college, in my, like the first time I had moved out and had my own apartment, the apartment complex had their like they covered internet and you just plugged in and you could access internet through their own network. The unfortunate part of that though, was I learned that you have to um, like, like whitelist your computer and you have to block any incoming traffic so that they can't view what your, uh, what your IP address is doing on that internal network. And I was like, Mm. Oh, that's the first time I realized that other people on your network can see what your computer is doing. Because Mm. one of my neighbors told me like, Oh, you're that sailor moon person. And I was just like, how do you know yeah, that? That's where weird. Where did that come from? Yeah, that they would could be see a what websites weird. I was going to. When you don't yeah. know, yeah, and like mm-hmm. they could see my file directory. Like, I and I had no oh, idea that wow. was a thing. So that's mm-hmm. when I learned like security is important. So I asked one of my friends if he could teach me about it. So I learned about like networking and how to protect yourself on internal networks. So that was fun, um, and it was during college, it was during those college years that I took a coding course and I learned about like the back end and how you really have to learn how code, uh, how code works online in order to like protect a website. Like you have to make sure that you're encrypting your passwords, which was not a big thing when I was Mm -hmm. in, in college. Mm -hmm. Uh, and around that time, I also started developing an interest for cybersecurity, um, protecting yourself online, mainly just because like I was a woman who was online using the internet, making a community, developing that community with other anime nerds. And I had to understand how to protect myself and how to protect the people that I was living with. Um, Mm -hmm. But also because I wanted to protect myself, like when I was walking to school, like I wanted to make sure nobody knew who I was. Like, I was anonymous and nobody was following me to my house. Like there was a lot that just kind of, I developed naturally just by being a woman living on my own in an apartment complex and going to college. Like it was Mm -hmm. just things that I naturally wanted to learn. Um, So I, I found this group online who was also into video games. It was this pure ownage community. Um, it, it was this, it was this group out of Canada, out of Toronto, and they made this online show about video games. And through them, I made friends with the Hack Five crew because they were also creating internet TV shows. Uh, mm-hmm. So I ended up being really good friends with this crew. I moved in with them right after college into this like bachelor pad and they invited me to be one of the hosts. The Hack House. The name of it, the Hack House. Yeah, Yeah, the Hack House. Uh, (laughs) I lived there for about two years and even though like I didn't have a background in cybersecurity, it was just kind of a personal interest. Mm -hmm. Um, I developed such a passion for it by just seeing all the interesting things that you can do when you understand security and privacy. Absolutely. And that was probably a, an experience of just total osmosis, right? You're surrounded. Oh, totally. You're yeah. living on a daily basis for two yeah. solid years with people, with other people who are also very interested and, in, you know, active in that se- the security community. I yeah. mean, you can't not learn a bunch about that. I imagine that was Yeah, you're kind of like, you're kind of forced into it. Like when you mm. live in a, in a, a little town home with a bunch of other nerds who are into cybersecurity. Like you're just kind of, it just kind of happens. It's like yeah. when you move to another country that doesn't speak your language, you just mm-hmm. kind of create this osmosis of just being around it constantly. And you start yeah. learning the language naturally. Eventually you get Same it. Yeah. thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And eventually you get it. So by becoming a host on that channel and starting with some pretty easy segments, um, I, I wrote, every single one of my own segments on my own. Sometimes I asked for help if I got stuck on something. And that's when I started learning new concepts because my friends would help me. But every single segment that I did on Hack 5 up till today, like I've written every single one of those on my own. And I'm so proud of that because Mm -hmm. so many people become a host and they don't write their own scripts. They don't do their own projects. They have a producer to do that for them. But I've always written my own stuff. Like that's always been a rule of mine. I'm like, nope, I will do my own thing. No chat GPT, no dudes writing (laughs) segments for me. Like I will learn this on my own. 
I will ask yeah. questions where I need to because no question is a stupid question, but I will sure. write everything on my own. And yeah. because I just developed this natural interest in security, I found books to read and I found this community through conventions that we started going to like DEF CON or some of the local like hacker uh, and cybersecurity events. And I would start asking them questions about like, what else can I do? Like, oh, I can learn how to pick locks. Like that's a thing. That's a, that's, you know, physical security. That is mm -hmm. penetration testing. Um, I learned about how the internet of things is so absolutely hackable. Uh, I learned how to jailbreak phones at the time. And I just kind of like ran into this rabbit hole in this natural obsession of all these interesting things that you can learn. And when you're naturally learning all of this, you understand so much more about the devices and the hardware and the software that you use every single day. Like I'm not using cybersecurity every day. Like I'm not focusing on it, but it's now, now it's just like a natural thing that is kind of in the back of my mind constantly. So like when I hop online, I always check them to make sure my VPN icon is live. Like that's just, mm -hmm. it's just something that I look at because I, I now I don't even need to think about it. It's just there. <laughs> and I right. do the same thing when I'm, when I'm creating an account on a new website, like I just, I don't even think about making a new password. I just go to my password manager and auto generate some new password. That's mm -hmm. like 128 mm -hmm. characters long or however long I'm allowed to make it on the, on the website. Like I don't know any mm -hmm. of my passwords because mm -hmm. they're all in a password manager. <laughs> so it's yep. just like you, you create this, it almost became kind of becomes a part of your lifestyle. Like some right. people like to keep their house clean and that's a part of their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Me, I like to keep my online security habits updated and that's just kind of become a part of my lifestyle. So I've tried to use that natural interest and develop it for consumers and p people that really right. need this as a part of their life too, because not everybody is thinking about security and privacy all the time. Like, I weirdly am. <laughs> but the so fact that you have that depth, yeah, it makes yeah. you a really great teacher for that yeah. information, you know? And I think that given I, I didn't develop that interest when I was a young kid, like I was into gaming and, and building websites and like theater and building computers. Like I was into that kind of stuff, but I didn't develop that interest in cybersecurity until I wanted to learn it for hosting hack five. And I think because of that, because I didn't come from that background as a child, like I'm able to look at it from a consumer perspective of mm -hmm. a, like a, like a normie per per perspective. How can I teach somebody like my mom or my sister or my yes. best friend about security and privacy, but make it so it's not scary. And so it's not weird and overcomplicated because that's the yes. problem it's, that it's so many accessible. people find. Yeah. yeah. I try to make it so accessible now. And I really like, I, I think it's because I didn't grow up around cybersecurity. It was just something I found along the way. <laughs> hmm. That's so interesting. I love that. Thank you for, for all that detail. Cause that, that my, really... my long winded answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I love that. And one, one thing um, that I really want uh, that I really respect and celebrate about you as a person is that you've spent a lot of your career, at least in my eyes anyways, um, being a really wonderful advocate for women in technology. And, oh, yeah. you know, in, in an industry which it's, I mean, I think you'd agree that that is so perceived to be so male driven and male dominated and oh women don't do security that's a that's a male thing you know and and by the way i'm not talking about these things as if i believe them but i think that there is a perception and you know that goes along with this and you have done a wonderful job at career of countering that perception and showing like no that isn't actually how it is that's that's just that just might be the way you think it is or that doesn't need to be the way that it is I don't know. I, yeah. I really respect that about. I you. think, I think, um, like there's there's a portion of society that has always had that perception of women don't belong in tech, right? And right. A, I do see a lot of that in like social platforms. I see a lot of that in replies to my tech videos or comments yeah. on my threads, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. kind of <laughs> on purpose, but we won't, <laughs> we can discuss that later. <laughs> Engagement. Um, 
<laughs> engagement, baby. <Right? laughs> Engage, engagement. <laughs> so I've, I have noticed that to this day. And, and I noticed it a lot when I was younger um, to the point where there were many times when I was building videos for Hack 5 that people were just like, oh, your co-host wrote this segment. Or they'd be like, you're just on the show because you're dating your co-host, um, mm -hmm. which I'm married and my husband doesn't do any videos <laughs> online. Mm -hmm. He has nothing mm -hmm. to do with my job. Uh, mm -hmm. So I had a lot of people like doubting my expertise, uh, which I was new to cybersecurity, but I was also learning everything, learning all these concepts on my own. Um, yeah. I had like a lot you of said, like, like you said, writing all of your scripts, like you know, right. being, being yeah. responsible for all that content, that information. In fact, I think I still have all my scripts. Like I, I always wow. kept them in like Word docs. So I'm pretty uh -huh. sure I still have all of my Ooh. scripts. Yeah, that's, I know. That's ridiculous. That's like that's a library. 2000, 2000 plus video. Like it's a lot <laughs> over all the different <laughs> channels I've been a part. It's a Heck lot. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I've, I kind of, I think that over time, I'm trying to word this correctly because of the early experiences that I had with like, harassment stalking mm. like i had a stalker show up at the company we both worked at um <laughs> which oh was goodness. insane um mm -hmm. and had to get the police involved because of it um i've had people send weird gifts to my house when not here because i've learned more about security but right. i i had people do that when i was living in an apartment when i first started with hack five i had people call my phone when i first started with the company and they were like hey just wanted to let you know your phone's online like uh, i i had no idea that there was mm -hmm. so so many concepts out there that i needed to learn and that kind of helped me like delve into it i was just like oh this is a thing i need to learn how this works it, yeah it and illuminates it that. illuminates an aspect of it that that yeah. uh you know could use your attention that pulls you into the process <laughs> as uncomfortable yeah. as it probably was <laughs> that gives you so it, an even greater reason to dive into it and then to share that information I, with other people so that they don't find themselves in that yeah situation. and i i think because of those experiences like i don't want to see other girls have mm. to have those kind of experiences. So for I've sure. always been a really big advocate for other women in technology who, who have found those passions through their childhood interests or who have found those passions through classes that they may have, may have taken in high school or college and really want to delve into this as a career. And I would rather like a young woman go into this career and know that she has a foothold and, is paid correctly and is al allowed to be interested in these things without having to mm -hmm. deal with like harassment at work or something like that. And I, I want to advocate for those, for those women because I experienced that and I don't want them to as well. So I want to be like a good role model and show them mm -hmm. that like, yes, it's possible. Um, we, we still have to fight to this day. <laughs> like I've had conversations with other YouTube hosts, um, some of the men that work in my industry and we'll compare notes in terms of like what sponsors offer us. And I know that sometimes I'm not offered the same amount of money that somebody else is offered. That is a male. And we might have like the exact same type of views and subscriber numbers and watch time on our channels, but he's just treated differently because they perceive him as being, I don't know, like maybe somebody that's a better spokesperson or maybe it's just, it, maybe it's just sexism. Like you never really know. Yeah. Um, but that's helped me understand what I should be valuing myself at. And it's helped me understand that I do need to advocate for myself as well as for, you know, other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm other women. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a huge amount of respect for you and the, and the work that you do in general as a human being and also being a wonderful um, kind of example and advocate for the fact that like there, there is no difference between men and women in the world of technology, even though I people, agree. you know, even though people, you know, it, it's such a, a constant, I think, struggle and battle to get people to understand that. But it's just a fact. It just is what it is. And I think you're a wonderful example of that. So thank I appreciate you. that. I, well, I think I, you're I, a I, wonderful I, ally. <laughs> <laughs> you always well, have been. <laughs> thank you, Shannon. I, I really adore you. Um, before we round this out, uh, there's one quick question. If technology, security... 
Twitterverse, what what would you be doing right now? What would what would be your career? What would be your focus? Oh my gosh. Would it be a theater or my, something else? My internet just like went a little crap for me. So can you repeat the question, sir? Oh, of course, of <laughs> course. Yeah, no worries. Um, final question. Um, if we're in an alternate universe and technology didn't exist, security in technology didn't exist. Um, what, who, what would you be doing? What would your career be if you didn't have a career in technology? Would that be theater? Would that be something else? That is such a good question. Um, I feel like I would probably be, Ooh, that is a hard question. There's so many other interests that I have. Like (laughs) I'm like, I'm weirdly into like, you know, (laughs) <laughs> Sailor Moon, of course. So maybe I would be, maybe I'd be a voice actor because that would yeah. take my, my like theater interests and my anime nerd, nerd dumb and like develop it into a career as a voice actor. Like I, mm-hmm. I, that, I feel like that would be something you could be really a fun that I'd be good at. Yeah. You could be a character or, Sailor Moon. That sounds like a pretty awesome <laughs> job. Oh my gosh. That would be amazing. <laughs> I have some friends who are voice actors for Sailor Moon and they're like incredible. Like I'm so oh, amazing. I, I always no like, I'm so proud of them and it's so, it's such a hard job. Like being a voice yeah. actor, it's oh, a yeah. very hard job. People for don't sure. give them enough credit. Like they do incredible work. And mm-hmm. there's so many times when you'll hear about like the emotional toll that it takes on them whenever they're developing these characters and doing the voices, like they really get into their characters and it is acting hundred percent. Like it is mm-hmm. very hard work. Um, so that would be really fun. I'm really into like floral stuff so maybe floral arrangements okay. like, <laughs> that sounds super might have been a photographer well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, everything that i'm into has always been very creative like whether yeah. it's artistry around florals which is a weird thing that i like gardening and plants and stuff like like Not propagating plants <laughs> mm-hmm. voice acting photography like i'm i'm really into those kind of things yeah um or maybe because i learn Japanese language. I'm, I'm not at any expert level. I'm still a beginner. Like I'm be elementary if anything. Um, Mm -hmm. maybe I would be a translator. Like maybe I would have developed that into an expertise and become a a translator for English and Japanese. Like that would have been something that I probably would have done if I didn't choose this career, but yeah, Yeah, (laughs) I like my career. (laughs) Yeah, no, I know. I, I hear you. Well, you're a creative at heart, not just a creator, but a creative, Um, It sounds like in many facets of your life. Yeah, always. uh, You're you're an awesome person. Thank you for uh, talking to me for a little bit today and sharing a little bit more about yourself, Shannon. This was fun. Thank you, Jason. Yes, I had a blast. It's so good to see you too. Yeah, great to see you too. (laughs) And of course, folks should head over to, is it at Shannon Morse on on YouTube? It is. is Yep. Okay, so youtube.com slash at Shannon Morris, I'm looking up in the URL bar and it says slash channel slash blah, 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 blah. And I don't know what I did to get that, <laughs> but it is at That's Shannon the channel Morris. URL. <laughs> That's right. And what is your, uh, is it Sailor Snubs is the other one? Yeah, Sailor Snubs. So yeah, youtube.com slash Shannon Morris is the tech channel um, for my Morse code show. And then youtube.com slash Sailor Snubs for the Sailor Moon channel. There we go. I've got here one real quick second as my dog goes nuts at the door. There we go. There's the Sailor Snubs uh, page as well. Shannon, thank you so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you. Thank you. Of course. Of course. And we will see you soon. I'm sure I'll uh, be hitting you up for uh, some more advice along the way. (laughs) We can (laughs) all use a little advice. (laughs) Thank you, Shannon. All right. Uh, Thanks again to Shannon Morris. Uh, Everybody, listen up. We could not do this podcast without your support. That's right. Every week, I love doing uh, the Texploder podcast, but it does uh, kind of rely on your support to help us out. So you can do that via Patreon, patreon.com slash Jason Howell. If you go there, you can find a level of support that works for you. And, you know, you get some extra bonus perks along with that, ad-free shows, early access to, to videos, a Discord community, you get an exclusive pre-premiere. I guess it would be, if we're doing a live uh, recording of the podcast, it would be like a pre-show. And if it's not, then, you know, it's it's just a pre-premiere moment. It's like 30 minutes prior to the premiere of the Texploder podcast where I'm on hand to answer any questions you might have and chat with you. 
We also offer a chance to be an executive producer of this show, like this week's executive producers, Katie Lake, John Cuny, Bill Rudder, and Jeffrey Maricini. Y'all are awesome. Thank you so much for your support. Patreon.com slash Jason Howell. I do this podcast. Well, you can get this podcast anyways, every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific. And uh, actually when it's being recorded live, uh, you can go to the Texploder YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash at Texploder, and we will record it live to the page. If you don't catch it live, that's okay. Every Thursday in the afternoon, it will publish uh, to the YouTube channel and then also to the podcast page at Texploder.com. So really, if you need one way, one way to remember this, just go to Texploder.com. Everything you need to know is there. Really appreciate your support. Thank you again so much to Shannon Morse for joining me on this episode of the Text Loader Podcast. Thanks to you for watching and listening each and every week. We'll see you next time on another episode of the Text Loader Podcast. Bye, everybody.